everybody and welcome to this uh, LSE public lecture by uh, Professor Susanna Hecht from the University of California at Los Angeles. Um, I'm Michael Storper and I'm a professor here in the geography department and uh, because I'm only a Michaelmas term professor here, I'm also uh, Susanna's colleague in Los Angeles in the rest of the year. So it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Susanna, and uh, I want to say a few words about um, the background for this talk, the kind of work and uh, research that it emerges from. But before I do that, I need to tell you that the hashtag for this event is LSE deforestation. That's like you have to do that nowadays. Okay. So, um, actually, uh, so Susanna Hecht and I um, go back a long way because we were uh, PhD students together at the University of California at Berkeley. And um, University of California at Berkeley has a pretty long and distinguished tradition of doing human geography. And uh, we kind of come out of different parts of it because I do economic geography and Susanna does um, human geography in a, in a human environment relations in a wider sense. Um, and um, a little bit about what Susanna has done in her career. So um, if Susanna was one of the, I think, first um, at least North American and possibly European uh, people to go in and do massive field work in the Amazonian part of Brazil for her dissertation when cattle ranching was beginning to be a big force in uh, deforesting the Amazon basin and notably in the frontier state of Pará in Brazil. And uh, Susanna had the temerity to be in the field on the forest cattle frontier for a couple of years taking soil samples to see what happened when you cut trees down to the nutrients in the soil and what that augured for the course of uh, possible reforestation, of uh, resource depletion, of changes to, uh, 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 to fluvial processes, and of course to changes in human environment relations, who's actually settling this and whose interests and so on. And so Susanna was in all senses of the word a uh, pioneer like the intellectual kind, but also the tough, you know, on the frontier kind. And then, over a course of years, she widened her arc from that base in studying um, tropical uh, deforestation into what became a bestseller book that uh, she published called Fate of the Forest, uh, which was uh, co-authored with Alexander Coburn, and which um, really, I think, introduced to a wider public something that we in academia now think of as being a kind of an acquired term, which is that of political ecology. Um, the intersection of, um, of politics, policy, economics, and uh, widespread ecological transformation policies. Um, but she's branched in many other directions. It's actually impossible to give a full, a full list, but let me just refer to a few other kinds of things she's done. Um, I mean, in Fate of the Forest, they, they had a very wide-ranging analysis of the, uh, the, the economic, social, geopolitical processes behind deforestation, the effects on uh, settlements there, the effects on peoples, the effects on the construction of the nation in Brazil, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, Susanna was also instrumental in what was called the agroforestry perspective on tropical regions. You know, there's a kind of a widespread uh, impression, at least in the popular imagination, as many of you know, that you know tropical forests are these kind of you know virgin nature untouched by the hand of humans, and a tradition that Susanna worked in, uh, really in very cutting edge uh, ethnographic on the groundwork, was to show 
well, is and was to show that actually these tropical regions going way back have been in many ways gardened by humans for a long time and that the, what, we per, what, what the popular imagination often perceives as pure nature is not at all that, but it's a humanly shaped environment. And that has very, very important implications, of course, for debates that we have about conservation. Right? What are we conserving? And does it include, for example, people and human societies that are there, or is it mostly about trees and bugs? Um, there are, there's another big debate that Susanna's played a very big part in, which is the reconsideration of the pre-Columbian population of the Americas and um, a systematic uh, upward revision of a notion of how much of the Americas were populated and by whom prior to the arrival of the Europeans. It seems that the population estimates of who was in places like the Amazon basin keep going up because of researchers like Susanna and the kind of community she works in keep finding that human societies were, were more complex, bigger, more widespread than the standard accounts. Um, so there's, there's this historical work that works in. And then, you know, I'm skipping over lots of other steps, but, but in the interest of time. And, and the, 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 the recently published book, the one that you can, in fact, uh, buy outside and then come in here for signing after the lecture, um, A Scramble for the Amazon, The Lost Paradise of Euclides da Cunha. Um, so if there are any Brazilianists in the room, you know who Euclides da Cunha is, but if you don't, um, Euclides da Cunha is, is, is a canonical figure in, in Brazil because he wrote a book called Rebellion in the Backlands, uh, O Sertão in Brazilian, about a millenarian revolution, a revolutionary movement um, in the state of Bahia uh, in the late 19th century that was put down brutally by the Brazilian army and is considered to be part of the kind of founding of the Brazilian nation. But da Cunha, um, unbeknownst to the wider public, also explored Amazonia. And Susanna unearthed da Cunha's manuscripts on Amazonia. And on the basis of those archives, built her new book, which is a, re it's, it's a, it's, it's a complete reevaluation of the, we might say, geopolitics of Amazonia, and uh, we have accounts in other regions of the world of how great powers uh, played great games in many other parts of the world, like Africa. But this hasn't essentially been done for uh, post-colonial Latin America. And in the book, that's what Susanna does, in a sense, is she tells the story of the struggle to define um, who does what in Latin America with all kinds of twists and turns that have hitherto really not been published in the literature. So there's this pretty amazing body of scholarly work that Susanna brings to the talk she's going to give tonight. Um, and just let me mention that, you know, as you might expect for someone of her stature, she's got the pretty big list of accolades, you know, um, uh, fellowships from the MacArthur Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Geographic Society, uh, NASA, visiting posts, you know, at places like Princeton and Stanford, um, having written the National Environmental Plan for a few countries like El Salvador, um, having, you know, pretty much participating in a lot of the uh, high-level debates on climate change, and so on and so forth. So anyway, it's with a lot of pleasure that um, I get to introduce Susanna here um, to speak to us about some of the latest debates on uh, forestation, deforestation, and lots of other things. Thank you. Well, first of all, it's an incredible, I, I was going to be miked, but I don't, it turns out I have an operatic enough voice, so I don't have, so I won't have to embarrass myself by tripping around over cords, um, or clawing them off, or the usual thing that happens with electronic things that are on your body. 
Um, I want to say, first of all, what an honor it is to be invited here, and I, how delighted I am to be here to, uh, to spend some time with you. Of course, LSE is sort of considered one of the gold standards for the social sciences, and it's really incredibly, um, um, as I say, it's an incredible honor to be invited to speak. So um, what I'm going to do today, just to sort of give you a to give you an overview so that, you know, if by any chance your blood sugar goes down or you have to go to sleep, you'll, you'll be able to wake up at the end of the talk and know what's transpired, which is what I'm going to do is kind of talk a little bit about some of the preconceived ideas that we have about forests and forest dynamics. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about a rather um, extraordinary transformation the transformation of a lot of really strong declines in deforestation in areas that were classic for deforestation, like the Amazon, and also an extraordinary dynamic of forest recovery um, in places where, um, you know, as, the, as in the words of uh, Mr. Terborg, the famous ecologist, nature has been extinguished. So let me um, go ahead, and what I sort of, my sort of subtitle is instead of, of course, this is the academic from eco-catastrophe, you know, that kind of thing. This is, this is how I talk in some, if, when I have a, uh, a, an, a purely academic audience, but really what this is about is forests lost and found in Latin America. And what I will argue for you is that Yes, we can be talking about a green revolution, but we're actually in the midst of a kind of greening of the neotropics, which no one would have bet on. I would not have bet on in the year 2000 that um, forests in Amaz that the deforestation rate would decline after 2004 by 84%. I would not have put a bet on places like El Salvador as being you know, going from being almost, uh, uh, having only 2% of its forest intact to being now almost completely forested. So something really big is going on and it's happened in a short period of time and it's happened widely. Well, one of the problems I think that when we have, we have a kind of catastrophist view and a sort of linear view of what happens with forests. Biologists here know that um, there's processes of succession that you cut forests down and, you know, unless you keep doing a lot of energy to keep it down, it will come back. Um, the other thing, and I think that this is one of the things that really has, it's sort of the ideation and the, the way the representation of the tropics has been, is that it's sort of been like the, um, if the North's big problem in the 60s and 70s and, uh, and, and until uh, the, the early 80s was nuclear holocaust with its climate change and total destruction. The tropics had the sort of analogous thing which we call deforestation, where those smoky landscapes and climate change would emerge out of these processes of catastrophe. Now, I'm not arguing, and, and so the language surrounding tropical stuff has been very ca catastrophist, as though this place had no history. In the words of, of course, my beloved Euclides da Cunha, the, you know, he, he described it very ironically <clears throat> as a land without history in order to describe the landscape and then to go and imbue it with a social landscape. So in a certain sense, I'm going to take as my po point of departure the problems of habits of thought of these places as being um, inevitably and forever destroyed by the processes that occurred, but, and to change a little bit your view about that, but also to say that this dynamic of destruction was not a Malthusian nightmare that somehow unfolded, nor was it simply linked to uh, international markets. In fact, international markets probably have done quite a bit to help reconstitute these forests, but rather that we have to sort of look at the political changes that have happened in South America really since the 1990s. Remember that the last peace accord in South America on the authoritarian period is Guatemala in 1996. So we have a long 
we, th these reconstructions of these societies after civil wars and the authoritarian period really only begins in the 1990s. And so in a certain sense, what I'm trying to describe here is a really immense change in the political culture and the dynamics of these economies that went from really authoritarian capitalism into a globalized capitalism, but with a lot of different kinds of outcomes. So um, this, of course, is the picture that every, I love Manga Bay. I urge you to all go look at Manga Bay's pictures. I steal their pictures from my lectures all the time. They're really great. Um, and uh, so we have this sort of view. This is, of course, uh, the classic sort of fishbone, the, the ever catastrophic development of Amazonia, that these kinds of pictures are. Probably if you close your eyes, you can come up with other ones. I didn't bring one that had fire in it. I thought I would just ease up on it because I could sit and go through a, a, a panoply of these. But one of the things I'd like you to look at is this. What this shows is, and this is um, data that just, got, just came out. This is basically a map of, it's a, it's a, a summary of a wall-to-wall -wall MODIS, which is a kind of remote sensing uh, uh, set of programs and machinery uh, that looks at forest trend from 2000 to 2010. And what you see, of course, is that, boy, oops, sorry, go back, back, I tell you. Let's see, is this going to give me a, well, all right, those red dots are a lot of deforestation. The blue dots are a lot of forest recovery. And if you start to look, what you sort of see is, hmm, there's a lot of deforestation in different kinds of biomes. Um, those are, you know, large-scale ecosystem types like, you know, oak forests or pine forests or tropical rainforests or Andean forests. You can see those Andean forests that are coming back too. Uh, the Brazilian Northeast has got a lot of forest recovery. Anyway, uh, if you look around, what you see is sort of a surprising amount of blue. And, and of course you see lots of red, and we'll talk about wh why and where you see that red. But the important thing is not just to be thinking always about forests going down, but also to be thinking about forest recovery or forest resurgence, what's called in the literature the forest transition. Now, the forest transition itself has a lot of, you know, embellishments to it, and it has a lot of lot different kinds of logics. It's not like some kind of law of physics, you know. But um, in any case, there are a lot of processes at work, and I'll describe some of them for El Salvador, and I think it works a lot for mu much of Central America, about why we're getting forest recovery there. But one of the things that's very interesting is why are we not seeing is more deforestation in the sort of big heartland of Amazonia. And I think that speaks to the new kind of politics that I want, I want to discuss with you today. Well, first of all, the past doesn't predict the future. If it did, you know, <laughs> uh, the world would be a different place. Um, there are, as I've sort of mentioned, the, the sort of traditional models of explaining deforestation, they really rely, even though you can sit and uh, uh, talk about this your entire life, there still is a really big uh, population dynamic. And interesting, if I went back here, because they did this, they, the only thing they put in in terms of human action here was population density. And interestingly enough, those red areas, those high population areas, uh, those red dots, have the lowest population density, and forest recovery is occurring in those blue things. So it's just the opposite of what the arguments would have you believe. Um, oop, forward, forward. Um, the other thing is um, we're seeing, as I mentioned, not only a decline in deforestation, but also decline uh, extraordinary processes in uh, forest recovery. So what we have is the sort of decline of the processes of destruction and an extraordinary resurgence of other kinds of things. Well, there's lots of reasons for this. I'm showing you these slides so that you really understand how dramatic and how fast this has been. So, um, as I say, if you, if I, if someone had said, Susanna, 2000, okay, so by the end of this decade, we're going to go below the level that records have been kept in terms of deforestation, <laughs> I wouldn't have taken the bet. And I bet nobody in this room would have taken the bet. 
But what you have here is basically from 2004, an 84% decline in the rate of deforestation. Now, this isn't saying that there isn't deforestation going on. The rate of deforestation has simply declined extraordinarily. The, uh, and this is, of course, for the Brazilian Amazon, where they have excellent records. But the records are better elsewhere also. I and mean, you can see that same pattern is going on. And it's going on in the non, the non, um, uh, you know, the, the, the not Brazilian parts of the greater Amazonia. So we really are looking at a really major transformation and one that goes like a bat out of hell. It's really fast. Considering the scale, Amazonia would begin in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada, come out of New York. It's really big. So to, this is like having the, the Queen Mary behave like a Ferrari. It's extremely rapid, this transformation. So how do we, what do we know is going on? Um, well, one of the things I would argue is we move out of authoritarian capitalism and uh, civil conflict into a more, uh, a different regime. The other thing, so this is a period where actually um, because of this disruption in these societies, the rebellion in these societies that really undid the authoritarian period and the sort of peace, the emergence of peace accords and so on, which is this is this moment when there's a kind of reconstruction of the nation state. This is a period in which actually people are developing new constitutions. There are all new constitutions throughout Latin America. I, I know that sometimes many political scientists will be aware of this, but people who are concerned about environment might not think about what, it, so what you have is sort of the equivalent to take it into the American context would be at the, uh, the, the um, Constitutional Convention would, would not just be um, the elite of the American colonists, but you would have Indians, you would have uh, black uh, slaves, you would have various other kinds of ethnicities and so on and different kinds of people constructing a kind of um, uh, set of rules and institutions and processes that would permit them to go forward. So this is extremely important, this transition. The other thing is that this also occurs, of course, with, the, um, with structural adjustment processes, which are in many ways um, very dil uh, uh, dil deleterious. But one of the things that it begins to do is that, protect, and there's a lot of politics, I won't even go into it. But one of the things that's very important about this is the rise of civil society. It's still repressed. It still gets in a lot of trouble. But at least there's a political voice, and people are not actually being routinely shunted off into mass graves, which was a big feature of the authoritarian period. So one of the things is that you have the potentials for civil society and civil governance and an emergent what we might call green governance. With opening markets, you have, of course, uh, a lot of things that go on, and I'll tell, we'll talk more about that in a minute. But the green markets can be either, as they say, light green, which is a sort of marketing thing, or they can be really linked into the production process, which is what I think we might call deep green. Um, but those are very important things because not, not only do, and I'll talk more about them in a minute, but what they allow is essentially an open, opening venue for certain kinds of niche crops that become important. And for, I'll have a lot more to say about this in a minute. The other thing are environmental markets, and this is basically payment for environmental services. Most of you will be familiar, I think, with the idea of carbon offsets and so on. Um, but in Latin America, there's a bunch of different kinds of uh, payment for environmental services. These include re uh, reduced emissions and deforestation and degradation. It's, an, it's sort of the post-Kyoto uh, kinds of accords. But also, there's a lot of payment for water, uh, water basin management. So there's water councils and so on. Um, there's many different kinds of these kinds of environment, payment for environmental services, not just carbon. So I wanted to uh, emphasize that to you. The other thing is that social movements of many different kinds um, in this period make their claims for territory 
not on the basis of um, clearing, which had been the way that this had been done in the authoritarian period, but rather through historical claims. So before it was sort of, both, most of the land law was very archaic, it still had its roots in latifundias of various kinds, and or in the things of, in, in the state ownership. What you had emerging in this, in, it's in almost every new constitution, which makes it rather interesting, it derives a lot from the Brazilian case, is that people would say, well, you know, actually we're forest people. We have produced these forests. Uh, we have, uh, these forests have been providing income and including, you know, a major period of globalization, which is the rubber period, which is what that book's about. But that in essence, the claims that you could make to territory were historical claims and I, of identity and experience, and not just ethnicity, not just that you spoke uh, Kayapo or, or Guarani. So what this does is it changes the rules of the game about claiming land in an unusual way and in a way that's very important, as you'll see, for uh, transforming, shall we say, the Amazon map. The other thing that people forget about, because it's the tropics, you know, you have the forests and stuff, um, is how urbanized it is. About 85% uh, of Amazonia is urbanized. So like those people all <laughs> live in urban formations of one sort or another. If you look at Central America, you also see a highly urbanized or peri-urbanized or uh, unusually dense populations in a kind of urban form. I hate the term, but you kind of end up using these things that you hate simply because you have to use some kind of explanation. So maybe I'll come up with a more elegant term soon. But the point is that the spatial occupation, considering how immense this thing is and how dynamic it is, um, and how much deforestation used to de describe it is essentially a, a modern, it's a modern frontier in the sense that we're not talking about an agrarian transition, we're talking about a forest transition linked to urbanization, but in a complex way. So I'll have more to say about that too. So there's a few macro dynamics I want to keep in place and then we'll start to see what happens with the forest. One is that with the structural adjustments and the sort of rise of uh, uh, the, the free trade agreements and so on, the neoliberal trade regimes, particularly for grains, so for corn, for rice, but especially for corn because it's so important, um, during the, the authoritarian period and the transition period and the current period, you have a dynamic that's linked to keeping food prices low because when you don't keep food prices low, everybody blows up. Um, and so uh, one of the things is every time they try to privatize water, for example, blows up. Um, when you try to let the prices of, uh, 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 when you try, to, when grain prices go up, you get a lot of insurgency and, and unhappiness. So one of the things has been to um, keep grain prices low. And what that does for small farmers is it means that it costs more for them to produce than they get for that at market. So the classic example of this would be NAFTA, of course, where it really just completely undermined the domestic corn production. But a similar dynamic has occurred all throughout all Latin America. So these cheap food policies have meant that it's cheaper to buy food than to grow it, per, or that is to say it's cheaper to buy grains. Uh, and well, you'll be amazed to hear people do buy grains rather than grow it because it's more efficient. Um, what it means is that one of the dynamics of clearing, which has been for the production of small grains, annual cropping systems, has contracted as a part of that. Now, we, I, I was thinking, well, should I show how much is contracted in a different, well, just trust me on this and I can give you a reference to the paper that goes into it in more deal. The other thing with structural adjustment was that the subsidies into the farming sector, particularly into the small farm sector, 
were really wrenched away. For much of the 20th century, people thought of the peasantry as being kind of a revolutionary problem. You know, they had this like problem of rising up all the time from the Mexican Revolution on. And I can go through these revolutions. There's, uh, there's um, uh, 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 Bolivia, Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, of course, and also a lot of pre-revolutionary things. So one of the things was that small farms were sort of seen as a kind, you needed to subsidize them, not just um, for, so that they would participate in the food economy, but also as a kind of uh, counter-revolutionary uh, activity. So the state was a very important constituent of peasants, that is, they looked after peasants. And, and you can look at the sort of many of the policies of the 20th century as being, as providing certain kinds of subsidies into these small farms in order to sort of maintain um, uh, the rural sector as uh, to compensate for the uh, problems of, of, uh, of minifundization and so on. The other thing is that small farms were meant to be the kind of producers of small uh, of agriculture that is food was supposed to be produced by small farmers export stuff by plantations and somehow you would have this dynamic of a of a food uh, food economy on a division of labor between different kinds of farming systems but what happens is that this gets very disarticulated under the sort of uh, collapse of the grain economy. Um, and so since you can buy on the global market those grains, uh, and you're supposed to have austerity programs removing subsidies so that you can have more market level dynamics at play, what happens is that um, those subsidies are removed and you get huge destabilization in this sector as well. To compensate for that, however, you get what are called conditional state transfers. These are, many of you will know, the Brazilianists among you will know of the Bolsa Familiar. There's a thing for Bolsa Florestal. There's the Socio Bosques. There are um, Oportunidades in Mexico. Basically what they are is uh, a welfare transfer, a welfare paper pay payment that's meant to uh, permit children to go to school. You have to send your kids to school. They can't sit and farm. You have to vaccinate them, and it comes on a bi-monthly basis. So in essence, what happens is not only are you undermining the grain economy through global, globalized trade, national politics are undermining it through the taking away of subsidies, but you are providing cash in a particular way which is to go for sort of social welfare expenditures, uh, amongst which is usually included food. So what you have is a kind of restructuring of the peasant economy. And you know, you keep thinking, well, God, that's kind of a big deal. Um, but it really does happen pretty much all over the place. And the results of that are rather interesting. So I'm sorry to go through this in such detail. But I think people forget that forests respond not just to forest policy. <laughs> they respond to big macro policies, too, that they aren't just a little thing about, um, you know, the, um, they're not, the forest dynamics are not just driven, driven by endogenous processes, but by a lot of exogenous stuff outside. OK, so I've mentioned this structural adjustment. I should also say that there's this intense phases of globalization. I don't need to mention that to this audience. Um, also, there's huge technical change in agriculture. Uh, Brazil and many other places start to engage in genomic agriculture, um, high-intensity agro-industry in um, soybeans, for example. The other thing is that things like climate change begin to start to influence national policy. At all those, you know, con uh, convocations for energy things, and every four years, that you know, there's Copenhagen and Bali and so on, where all these ministers and stuff go and tromp in and discuss what they're going to do. But the point is that climate change starts to be really on the agenda. It was not on the agenda in 1992 in terms of forest policy. But the other thing is that many of these countries actually have a pretty good experience of knowing what climate change can do to you or what climatic disasters do. Emblematic in this regard is, of course, northeast of Brazil, which 
gets these periodic El Ninos, which completely collapse the agrarian economy. People migrate out for a while. There's, you know, there's endless suffering. They're sucked into either migrating to Sao Paulo in, uh, or into the Amazon. There's a lot of stuff there that is the impact of changing the weather into, even if you just do it for a few years, have huge amounts of social disruption. And, and this is, of course, Mexico, uh, the Andean countries, and Central America really do have very strong experience of, drought, uh, of droughts, and also not to mention the problems in Central America of these hurricanes that go through. Well, so one of the things is that climate change in the United States is kind of an abstract thing, whereas actually the impact of these kinds of climatic events on poor populations is quite visible. And so there's a little bit more interest in taking them seriously. The other thing I would argue is that the processes of actually transforming these states from um, the civil conflict that had so characterized them into their new form, whatever we want to call that, I'm not quite sure, um, relies on a kind of politics of agreement. That is, you have a sort of industrializing elite. It's sort of anti-oligarchic, anti-military in a lot of ways, and in favor of civil society. This is not to say that this is like some kumbaya moment between peasantries and social movements and the, the uh, emerging bourgeoisie that's linked to globalization, but rather that there are some agreements about um, not having everything be simply ad hoc and, um, and institutionalizing the um, ideas about property regimes, for example, or um, developing um, things like environmental um, agencies, none of which existed really in Latin America before 1996. Um, so those are the kinds of things I think that um, is important to keep in mind that we're really looking at, a, at, in this process of state formation, you kind of get a politics of agreement. And if I would say anything, too, and I, I didn't put this perhaps prominently in the, in the PowerPoint, but one of the things is if we're looking at the modern Brazilian or the modern Latin American states in the sort of post-authoritarian period, they are, they are the offspring of two very powerful, let's say, generalizable um, ideologies, one being neoliberalism, which you know, covers a lot of sins and a lot of virtues, and environmentalism, which also covers a lot of sins and a lot of virtues. So in a certain sense, these modern states Im are imbued with these two new kinds of ideologies, which in many ways kind of transforms how they function and how they work out the development questions in the rural. OK, um, well, some of these things I've sort of mentioned. Um, the, it, the, the key thing is the 1988 Article 6 uh, Constitution um, in the Brazilian thing, which, as I've mentioned, is this issue of using historical claims um, uh, as a form of traditional tenure, which basically uh, provides a kind of possibility of an agrarian, an in situ agrarian reform. What it does is it recognizes that forests are inhabited, that these are not empty landscapes, they're landscapes with a social history, and using that history to actually do, uh, to, to ratify, to do a kind of forest reform as opposed to the agrarian reform which previously already, always required deforestation. Um, so the other thing is that these institutions, because they're rather novel, are based on, often on traditional institutional forms that are given, let's say, more legitimacy and given, given frameworks. A classic example of this, of course, is the extractive reserve or the ajido, which basically is a, is a traditional form of, um, uh, of ten, uh, a ten, a ten, traditional tenurial regime, but one that starts to move within the, the modern context. But there are also some very novel ones that come out. Um, the kind of um, classic novel one would be actually the um, ecological reserve that comes out of uh, the American model of conservation, um, but also something like an environmental enclosure, like a, um, a carbon offset, which is a new kind of enclosure. So those are kind of novel 
novel things. So it's important to keep those in mind, that we have both novel and um, traditional institutions that become imbricated in these frameworks, both in the neoliberal and the globalized market dynamics, as well as in different kinds of environmentalisms. The other thing is that, and I think this again, and I, I'm repeating myself, but I'm repeating myself for a reason, which is what we do in this transition from the authoritarian state into the new state is to say that inhabited forests can have conservation value. Because before, you had either a, a sort of biological set aside, and which was not a producing or produced only environmental services, but that wasn't even the language of it. It was like conservation of biodiversity. Uh, or you have a kind of agro-industrial landscape. So it's, it's the wild or the wrecked that you had as your binaries. And what this model does is says, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Those forests, those wild forests that you love so much, actually they have a huge amount of human content in them um, historically and even in the present day. So this, is, this epistemic change is really important in the transformation of what, we're, what we sort of are describing. Um, the other thing that we have too is that we move to a more science-inflected form of development, which means that we're not just having the boys' own stories of uh, Bates and Wallace and you know, Fawcett and any number of them who take their careening tours down the Amazon and they, just, they have adventures and it's really great. Uh, of course, they, this was a kind of spy trip on another thing which makes it even more alluring now certain way. So in, in a certain sense, what you have is a natural history model where you would have these geniuses and these brave guys uh, running around and then um, uh, they would report back and change science. Um, Euclides de Cunha has nothing but sort of wry comments to make on them because he always said they stood at the threshold of the forest because they basically were going up and down the um, main channel of Amazonia, largely on a, how shall we say, um, uh, on steamships. And who was running around doing the collections, of course, were people that they hired in these places. But anyway, not always. But what we have is a shift here, really, in terms of understanding Amazonia, even though that gloss of the, you know, the jungle boy is still there, you have a shift into a very large-scale science that um, is, has its roots, of course, in planetary science and in military science surveillance, but also it starts to be able to monitor what's going on and also to describe what's going on better, and the information starts to go into a feedback loop about land use. Um, the other thing is that there's the rise of environmental services and ecological economics in the framing of what goes on here. So when we're talking about changing epistemes, we're talking about kinds of new, new kinds of analytics and ways of looking at the forest that go well beyond you know, um, people taking a boat on the Amazon and you know, shooting an alligator and so um, into a whole different realm of understanding, um, which of course is you know, the modern realm, which is um, um, predicated on a different form of science. So what I'm arguing actually in some level is that what we're seeing now is sort of three big macro landscapes. The Urwald, which is the sort of archaic wild forest, whether it really is wild or not is another debate, but the idea of an Urwald, the forest primeval, as one form of changing these landscapes. The second is the Neonatur, that's the agro-industrial genomic landscapes that now comprise a huge amount of Amazonia. The third would be the socio-natures of various kinds. And each of them is at work in these things. They have different values, um, but some of them overlap. They have different institutionalities, really quite different institutionalities. They're all imbricated in financing and markets. They're all globalized. Every one of these is globalized. They have different discourses, politics. They make uh, coalitions with each other. But each of them uses history and environmentalisms in the current construction of development trajectories, and they're really dynamic. So we're really in a kind of different things. Um, I'm going to just like switch over this, never mind. 
So, um, you know, because I could just like carp at you about, well, you see, it really is different now. Um, it really is different. But what you see here is kind of an embodiment of this. This map is the embodiment of the Urnatur, which is our little, oops, sorry, which is our dark, our dark green nature there. The light green is the socio natures. And um, see, I keep thinking that this, is a, this has a, is a, is a, a laser thing, but it's not. Uh, and then this red thing is the genomic um, agro-industrial development. So if you look at a map of land use in Amazonia, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting dynamic, it's an interesting dynamic, but the other thing is that while um, basically over 60% is in some of the co total conservation area, whether it's light green, dark green, or whatever, <coughs> is in, um, is in um, human, uh, human occupied landscapes. I think it's very important to bring up, well, of course, the great martyr Chico Mendes, and I don't know if you have fate of the forest here, but that's sort of about the rise and, and death of Chico Mendes. Social movements in Amazonia um, are very strong, and they have had a lot of political influence on the creation of generalized global environmentalisms, and not the least of which is this idea of occupied landscapes using traditional institutional things within the framework of modern economies and modern states. Um, what his legacy in many ways is, is a kind of emergence of green governance. Now that can be light green or dark green, um, uh, or as we say in Portuguese, verde light. Um, but one is that inhabited conservation areas are socio-environmental constructions. Now, this isn't a big deal for social scientists to understand, but many of the modelers don't quite get this. Um, the other thing is that, so there's one that is the sort of so, pure socio-environmental thing. The NGO conservation governance would be, uh, you might not know this, but, and, but most of the environmental set-asides that you have in Latin America are managed by NGOs. They're not managed particularly by the state. There's a sort of state uh, um, public-private partnership with NG international NGOs basically managing these areas. You also have the increasing use of producer associations as part of green governance. These can be in, you know, hyper industrial, like uh, in, um, sustainable soy, which is, you know, entre asperas, as we say. Um, but also this idea of municipio verdes, where basically you have uh, producer associations whose land uses are tied to continuous monitoring. If they deforest too much, all credit for these areas go away. So there's a whole bunch of sort of, as they say, carrots and sticks, but very severe monitoring in order to re recuperate areas with very high rates of deforestation. So the Municipio Verdes, the green um, municipalities, perhaps is not very well known here, but it's now a, mo a model that is being widely looked at uh, in, uh, throughout Latin America as a means of slowing deforestation through both state monitoring, private monitoring, and the use of state capital as a mean, and, and, and sanctions as a means to slow deforestation. But if you want to recuperate your land, there's lots of money for that. Territorial associations, so we're talking about the sort of elite things on these uh, sustainable soy and municipio verdes, but you also have territorial associations, which basically, the, the stuff on the shingu was basically to stop certain kinds of development that were undermining both peasant areas and what they deemed to be their future. There's also regional peasant associations and also private landowners that begin to get incentives and also participate in various kinds of green markets. So I always say from green hell to green markets, um, markets often being hellish. Uh, there's this commodity thing, which is the explode, uh, which has been manifested most in the sort of explosion of green niche markets. Um, I don't know if you are all drinking acai, but you can't go into a supermarket. Acai is a little palm fruit. I'll show you pictures of it in a minute. And um, it's supposed to be a wonderful health, health beverage, give you infin infinite life and so on. 
Um, and so, but there's other things too, uh, not the least of which is coffee, cacao, something called guayusa from, from Ecuador. There's a bunch of these like little niche things that have a lot of, um, uh, of green marketing and also there's sort of these social organic markets at the same time. The other thing is that even as you're having these kinds of markets on the agricultural and, and shifting cultivation plots that still remain, because there are plenty of those, you also have um, the, the development of short-term timber markets, that is timber that's produced for um, popular construction that's produced in about five years. The other thing is that's happened too that has sort of changed the commodity scene is the world of commodity chains. So that um, many of you may be familiar with the Greenpeace anti-soy, anti-Amazonian soy things. There's the Greenpeace anti-palm, Greenpeace anti-beef. Uh, and what they've done is through the supply chain, they've now, um, suppliers like Walmart and Carrefour and Pal de Azucre, which is in Brazil, is a big deal. Um, they won't buy Amazonian beef or deforestation beef or deforestation products. So what happens is that that may be a marketing thing more or less, but if you do start to buy it, it's considered an environmental crime. So then you have to, you know, that's, you, know, you don't want to be an environmental criminal for heaven's sake. That's for small farmers to be criminalized, not, you know, important industry. Um, so uh, the other thing, of course, is that this is linked to monitoring and certification and so on. So there's a whole uh, emergent sort of green structure at de several different levels that emerges around this question of commodities. But what they do is that a lot of these results are, are based not on clearing for small farms or clearing for agricultural annual production, but they're based on perennials. And if you do annual production, you're under uh, a different kind of boycott system. Well, these are some of my favorite things. Um, this is acai, of course, which you would be drinking for your excellent health. Um, shrimp go into the local market. Um, so this, is the inter this goes into the international market. This goes into the local market. And the, the fried fish, this was a delicious meal, let me tell you. Um, the fried fish, of course, goes into, well, it, in this case, into my mouth. Um, and uh, of course, there's a little bit of, of manioc in the back, which is part of integrated into agroforestry systems. But what you see is the p marketing dynamics and subsistence dynamics all working in the, same, in the same production system. The other thing is I make a distinction between green markets and environmental markets. Um, environmental markets really are, for the most part, much more internationalized. They involve much co uh, more complex flows. They're really dominated by carbon. But I just wanted to make sure you understood that that's not the only thing. Um, they're very controversial uh, when you're in, these, in Amazonia, for example, because um, what would happen is that people would sort of say, well, in order to get the red money, which isn't just government money, it's raised off of capital markets. So if you have an environmental enclosure, let's say you're the nature conservancy, which how you conserve land is you go and buy it. So you buy your land, and then a derivative of that, derivatives, we all know what derivatives can do, but a derivative of that would be, um, would be the carbon. And in order for people to invest in that, you have to make it not risky. And that usually means that you have to do a complete kind of enclosure that doesn't involve people. So if you've been following the politics, it's been extremely controversial, controversial because it's meant the loss of a lot of traditional land uses and the loss of autonomy in inhabited landscapes, which is why a lot of them have rejected red, including those um, uh, uh, who were involved in the AB 32, which is the state of California's red transfer thing to Chiapas and Acre. Um, which is a state in Brazil. The other thing is you, you, you put yourself into super surveillance. Now, I suppose we are all giving up on surveillance now, you know, it's like, what the hell? You, privacy, you have no privacy. But under these kind of super surveillance, you can have, um, you know, some environmental group tromping in and, and uh, fining you for whatever thing. And it, so it has this process which is widely noted in other kinds of, of, of enclosures of sort of criminalizing or semi-criminalizing traditional practices. So it's very, it's very complicated, but there's a lot of money in it. Well, 
So what do we arrive at? Well, basically, we have a new rurality. Small farmer dynamics have really shifted. They're increasingly semi-proletarianized, which means they engage in wage work, so you know they can buy things. They're also increasingly semi-urban. There's a whole capital flow of remittances, pensions, and state transfers that also go into these houses, so that they're households, so that they're linked in other con other ways. The other thing is really we may be seeing sort of the end, and not really the end, but a real uh, attenuation of small farm annual cropping because it's just not worth it. The other thing is that we are also seeing a rise of clandestine economies. These situations are pretty dire. Um, so the kind of dynamic we're looking at also is that rural households are often urban households. That is, our models for understanding what's going on in these places, the urban transition, the agrarian transition, and forest transition, they just don't make any sense. Um, there are lots of questions that we could still keep asking, and I'm not going to at this juncture because I'm going to switch to someplace else. But it's important to realize that when you look at the Amazon, one of the reasons that it's not turning into the, there are certainly forest areas, but that forest area is the agro-industrial frontier. It's a highly capitalized, highly capitalist frontier. But you have this other kind of dynamic going on that incar incarnates some of the things I've talked about. I'm going to go very quickly through Forest Found. It's just a few slides. It's a really complicated story, but I wanted to sort of transform your understanding of the sort of catastrophist narrative that there's an, a lot of other things that have gone on and that, um, you know, of course, we all should be depressed all the time, but I, you know, I have kind of a cheery personality, so. Um, Okay, so these are the forest founds. And one of the things about this is we're not talking about wild nature. You know, we're talking about anthropogenic landscapes. And these anthropogenic landscapes are often just as biodiverse. They may not have the, all the same characteristics of mature forests. There are many of them only 30 years old, but they have a lot of the characteristics. And the other thing is that they have complex origins. They could have been, uh, land could have been, been abandoned because of war, because of migration, because of policy, lots of different things. So this takes us back to this map again. <clears throat> and what you want to take a look at is how much these are the areas that actually are, in, this is, you know, these are inhabited landscapes. This is the Andes. The Andes is full of people. Um, Central America, it's full of people. The day it's really dense. And these exactly are the areas where you're having a lot of forest recovery. <clears throat> well, um, I've spent a lot of time in El Salvador. And I, I would like to say, well, they followed my policies to a T. And that's why forests came back so well. Uh, but when I was going through them, I was going, God, it's full of forests. And everyone's saying, we don't have any forests here. And of course, that meant that they meant they, the imaginary of the primary forest wasn't there. But what you can see, and what I'll show as we go along, and I'm really almost done here, is some of the dynamics of what became, uh, um, what was at one time one of the most uh, deeply deforested places in, in um, 1992, that even by 2001 had become much, much, much more forested. And there's a third slide. I couldn't find it this afternoon as I was groveling to get this together. But what you can see is that there's very rapid forest recovery. And the third one is, you know, it's all this huge, dense green. So it's quite remarkable. And this isn't a picture that is unique to El Salvador, which has the highest population density in Central America. It's something that you see everywhere. Um, well, part of the reason is that it's gone through this whole transformation in its economy. I won't go into the fact that it also went through a civil war which exiled 20% of its population, um, uh, pulled, you know, really contracted the agricultural frontier, and essentially switched the sort of dark, the traditional uh, production system into a remittance-based economy through Central America. So one of the things about, and, and this is like gives you an idea about why nobody grows corn, because it's like worth a third of its value that it was um, in the 1970s. But one of the things that happened is in this process, and particularly those of us who live in California, it's full of Central Americans and Mexicans, 
And one of the things that's really important in these economies is that people send back remittances. Now, remittances are not just unique to Central America. Um, the international amount of remittances, according to the World Bank, is something like 440 billion, and about 10% of the global population is migrating. So when we want to sort of look at what's going on with forests now, you can't just sort of say, well, it's just all going on endogenously. You have to look at what's going on more broadly. Well, a colleague of mine from the Jet Propulsion Lab, um, Sasan Sachi and I started to look at the relationship of households with remittances and then their forests. He's a, a remote sensing guy. And so we could go from areas that had high levels of remittances to areas that were low, and whether they <clears throat> did more clearing and how their forest resurgent look, resurgence looked. Well, when you saw a high percentage of household remittances, you didn't see very much forest clearing, and you also saw a lot of forest recovery, which meant that not only were new areas not being cleaned, but older areas were either allowed to go into succession that is, they were sort of into secondary vegetation, or they were going into um, d different kinds of tree crops. So this, con this relationship between forest clearing and remittances is one starting to be one of the major topics for figuring out what is driving the forest transition, which isn't just urban migration, it's circular migration, and it's also this question of remittances and get thinking again back to what we said before. Okay, I'm really done now. Um, huge structural changes have occurred. So we, ha we really are going from authoritarian to a different kind of system. And it, uh, it's dramatically reflected in land cover and land processes. The second thing is that globalizations are working these systems a lot, both in terms of labor, labor markets, commodity markets, environmental markets, but also finance, institutions, clandestine economies, I could talk for hours about that, but I won't. Um, also, the kind of globalized planetary science and issues of urbanization. So these are all, these are really big processes. The second thing is we have a lot of impacts of migrations that are very poorly documented for their impact on forests. Um, the other thing is that these are, we, not only are we really restructuring these economies and moving people out, there's this huge mobility, but also we're just seeing changes in vulnerability patterns and that the habits of thought that we have about what drives deforestation, what produces conservation, are perhaps not, uh, adi don't adequately reflect the real dynamics within the kinds of transitions that we're looking at. The other thing is that Latin American societies are still in the process of nation building after two generations of authoritarian rule. And so what we are seeing is a kind of working out of the natural resources things. So the things that I have described today may not be in place in a decade, but um, in any case, what we do see is certainly a very strong set of dynamics that work toward keeping forests up. The other thing is that if we want to keep, think about what development might look like in the next, in the next time, in the next decade or two, what we really need to be thinking about is some of the complex local dynamics that are linked to these global processes and planetary processes, remittances, multi-sided households that are urban and non, how local knowledge systems work into this, how you modernize traditional institutions and forests in the complexity of income formation. Um, the other thing is that what is talked about in Latin America a lot right now is what's called the new rurality, which is you know, another bad word, but you know, <laughs> forgive the jargon. But in any case, um, the role of the rural for small farmers is very different from simply the sort of historic role of peasantries. That rural area is kind of a platform for, from which you develop many other kinds of income formation things. The dynamics that I've described do not necessarily give you uh, an equitable outcome. These people still remain very poor, but what you see is that the role of the rural is not strictly rural anymore. It's very much linked to global processes and regional and national urban things. 
Um, so it's important to realize that it's not strictly an the rural household is not an agrarian site per se, nor are urban places increasingly really urban. I haven't. If I, I would spare you to not. I'm not going to talk about that. And the other thing is that these places are globalized as well as local. So um, back to our forest. Well, this looks like a forest primeval, but actually this is a really fabulous um, acai agro forest. And a forest is one big thing, as the Kai I learned amongst the Kayapo working on um, indigenous soil management and how, they, how you make tropical dark earths, um, which is a forest is one big thing. It has plants, it has animals, and it has people. And that's where we end. Thanks so much. Two on there, um, and I think you will now take uh, questions I'll in take debate, questions. right? There's plenty of so you plenty of lacunae here. Yeah. One part that you emphasized in your talk was that a large part of the reforestation and the drop in deforestation that's taking place seems to be taking place unintentionally through mechanisms that are not necessarily aimed toward that end goal. Um, but there's still some intentional mm -hmm. reforestation in place as well. Mm -hmm. Would you say there's a difference in sustainability between these two, these two different ways of getting to the same end result? Um, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things is that the least sustainable part of small of production systems tends to be these annual cropping things, because they, they that's why you had shifting cultivation as a long-term adaptation because. They're really unstable, whereas the sustainability really does in, inhere in tree crops and you know these sort of successional kinds of crops. Where the instability comes really is more in the labor markets. So the, it, it, if you have this sort of shift into more forest-based, forest product-based, you know, tree-based production systems of many kinds, um, those have a, a, those have a long adaptation and a long sustainability history. The problem has to do more with the socioeconomic cons constraints about whether people can continue to reproduce themselves in those areas. The explosion in the kinds of so forms of income really reflects how unstable that is and how prices have been uh, repressed. And also that people, um, there's better transportation and stuff, and people want their children. And, and also that sometimes they actually have to move to the city because their kids have to have to get the the, the transfers, the uh, uh, bolsa familiar oportunidades. They have to spend some time in the city so their kids can go to school. So there's a lot of things that undermine that. In this case, the sustainability is much less linked to um, to the pr to the actual production system. Although that would not be the case for like industrial stuff, which is all you know. Is, highly unsustainable without huge inputs of various kinds. So the answer is, it sort of depends on the socioeconomic dynamics about how sustainable it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how has this, um, I, I'd like to call it a natural sort of development that the Amazonia has gone through. How has this affected rural to urban migration? Um, if it has in any way? Well, there's a couple of things that have affected it. Um, again, partly um, the, the big process of rural expulsion is due to a sort of early his, earlier historical moment. So remember that the population of Amazonia increased not through reproduction so much, but through migration in as a function of agrarian reform movements. And a lot of these tropical deforestation stories that you get even in Central America and Mexico are frontier moving into migrations and then it doesn't work out and then they move into the city. So you have, a, you have had in Latin America a lot of movement from people from less tropical areas, because it's all in the tropics, you know, um, but from less humid tropical areas like from the Brazilian Northeast or the south of Brazil into Amazonia. Um, and then, you know, for whatever reason, there are lots of reasons, I'm not going to go through them, but um, prices, roads, the, the production system itself, the, about two-thirds of them don't make it. So there's a really high colonist attrition thing. 
And that then drives them in. The other thing is that, so that's one which is the problems of, of sustainability in the agrarian reform model. The other is that there's also, and has been, and, and still is, you know, Sister Dorothy just got, you know, the, the, it's not a quiet frontier in any way. But there's a lot of enclosure movements and there's a lot of expulsion. So one of the places, if you looked at that, where you'd see a hot spot would be a place in, would be the Petén in Guatemala. So there is a, also this combination of expulsion processes that are not completely done. And the violent, you know, this transition is not, these transitions are never not violent. Um, the third thing is that there's also a lot of um, uh, clandestine crops that are grown, particularly along the Andean and Amazon, that are grown in these systems. And they're vulnerable to a lot of repression. And um, so you have now in Ecuador, well, in Colombia, you have five million displaced people. And they go to cities because they can't, you know, they can't be in the rural area. And also there's all this glycophosphate, which is basically Agent Orange that's thrown on these things. So it kills their crops, so they have to leave. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of forces that are pushing this. What is interesting about it is in the processes of, the process of urbanization isn't sort of moving into a built city. It's increasingly an organized process of moving into what's called occupations, occupations. Ocupaciones, which is an organized movement. They, everybody goes in and just builds everything really fast and then starts to make claim on the urban, on the cities to provide other kinds of things, but to legalize these lots. So we call this phenomenon like the industrialization of, let's say, agroforestry or reforestation? Um, I would, well, see, these urban populations are also continue to be very forest dependent. They get part of their income. So there, there's multi-sidedness means that they're still maintaining an, an economic dynamic with rural property, or they're going, they're urban dwellers, but they go out and work in, in illegal timber, or they'll go and work in the coca, because coca needs a lot of labor to pull the leaves, and it needs it every six months. Or they go into other kinds of cyclic things, but they're urban-based. So in some cases, the urbanization starts to be a kind of labor depot uh, dynamic. So there's several, there are several functions that these urban areas are doing, and there's several migratory processes that are pushing migration. So you, you can't just sort of say it's just one, yeah, it's this multi, it really has to be, and there's been so little research on, on tropical urbanization, it's just a phenomenal, it's amazing. So very important research areas, you guys, and you don't even have to live in a jungle, you can just live in town, you know. Go to eat pizza, you know. Um, how about you, gentlemen in the white shirt? <clears throat> okay. I uh, vaguely remember, I think it was in 2010 or 2011, there was an auction held in Ecuador, and I believe it was even under the aegis of the oil ministry, uh, inviting companies and other countries to bid on pieces in their rainforest. And I believe the auction was ultimately cancelled because of lack of interest or there was just not enough bidding going on. I have two questions on this. One is, um, do you think this kind of concept to continue p preservation is actually viable? And secondly, um, what is your insight as to why did this not work in this particular case? Well, this case in, is, is Ecuador, and Ecuador is an OPEC country. Uh, the whole Western Amazon, by the way, is this, you, you know, sits on a lake of, of uh, har uh, hydrocarbons, as they say, um, of oil and gas. So it's a very rich, um, it's a r very rich resource area. What um, what this gentleman is referring to is that um, uh, Fernando Correa asked that um, said it will keep the oil in the ground if you give us a billion dollars, and we'll use it for development funds and so on. So in a certain sense, it was a kind of analogous thing to red, which is to say, we'll keep our forests up if you pay us for it. And uh, so it went out, you know, everybody was supposed, the, the, the Norwegians, of course, as they always do, stepped up to the plate. But everybody else was a little bit lack about it, lax about it. So he just said, nah, sorry, we're going to go, this is the block 13 of the Yasuni uh, Reserve. And that area is very interesting because there's a lot of ex oil exploitation that goes on in it.
And while the earlier Chevron, and, and as you, many of you may know, there were the, um, the Shuar Federation and other indigenous federations won a $18 billion settlement from um, um, uh, Chevron in the International Court, which of course is not, uh, Chevron hasn't paid or anything. But um, uh, because you know some people don't have to pay their bills when they get sanctioned by international courts. Um, uh, and you know it's just a bunch of Indians there anyway. Um, but what uh, the, it, it does have to, I was, I was there actually a lot this summer, and one of the things that's very interesting about it is that really the extraction techniques are a lot better than they were before. In a certain sense, there's been a, there's been a very, this has been, there's been strong regulation and repression about these. This is not, I'm not being an a, a apologist for these things. But the other thing is that essentially what happened in this is that they opened it for, for rebids and the Chinese bought it. And they bought it in exchange for a lot of infrastructure development. And the thing that's really great about the Chinese when you want uh, technical assistance is you go to the meeting and they just like, oh, well, I brought my checkbook. You know, you don't have to go through like irritating things like the World Bank wants to see a big proposal for environmental mitigation and so on. And so, you know, what about displaced populations? You know, all these kinds of worrisome and annoying little details. You know, the Chinese say, hey, how many? How many zeros? And um, it sort of goes like that. So one of the things, um, for various reasons, because remember that Ecuador sort of said, piss off to the IMF. So it can't go into international, the normal international capital markets. So it actually has a sort of little bit more flexibility in this regard. So the result is that they sold this to the Chinese. But the other result is, when they opened this up again, it was that there were there's there have been street um, manifestations, and a lot he's taking a lot of political heat for this at this time. I don't I don't know exactly where it stands right now. Do you maybe like take some oh, questions yeah. over there. Yeah, those people because you're so just sort behind. of cover the room. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Can you say please a little bit more about the quality of the regrown forest and the value um, of of that material? Uh, that's a really important question, and this is the question that comes up. It is the fundamental question about, boy, these re regrowing forests. In first of all, there, in Central America, you're dealing with a forest type that gets smashed around all the time. They have those hurricanes that we all read about, and they have a lot of those cause not only dump, they don't, they just blow forests down, they also cause a lot of landslides and stuff like that. So, so there's that. And, um, um, the other thing is that these are on, for the most part, quite good soils. They've also been very densely inhabited for um, at least uh, 8,000 years. And then, of course, we, you know, there's, a lot, there's a long history of occupation at fairly dense levels in Central America. And then, of course, we move into the last 2,000 years, you know, the, the Olmec, Aztec, Maya uh, universe, where the, you've had uh, the development of really large civilizations. So on one level, this is, a, this is a vegetation that has been whacked around historically. So it has a, it has a, a kind of re regrowth capacity that's been selected for over time. One of the things, um, that I'm, and I'm referring here to the work of, uh, of um, uh, a, a scientist, an ecologist named Roz Chasden. And basically she looks at how, you know, there's a lot of, increasingly a lot of studies for lots of different places about what happens with, when you, with this. And what you find is after 30 years, you get about 80% of the diversity that you had before. But it depends on how the land was. There's a lot of sort of riders on this. You know, It's not like you can just relax. But one of the sort of central uh, interesting debates is that actually secondary forests suck up more carbon than uh, primary forests, which are at s in this kind of semi-equilibrium. These tropical forests have stuff that falls down all the time, so they're a little more dynamic in terms of carbon absorption. But secondary forests really suck up um, uh, carbon. And actually, my colleague Sassan and I are still working on this, actually, for something that pertains to this book, which is there was a really big deforestation pulse in the upper Amazon as a function of the rubber boom. 
and there's an argument going on about um, the, the land without history crowd that says, well, you know, those forests were just, if there, there's a fertilizing effect of carbon, which is why those trees are uh, absorbing carbon more quickly. And we say, no, <laughs> you had a really big deforestation pulse, and that they're secondary forests, that's why they put them up. So these aren't, these aren't um, trivial things. The other thing is that, again, the, the kind of biodiversity that you can get in these things and the kinds of, let's say, non, not just carbon services, but other kinds of services, you can really get them off of young forests. Um, that is 30 or 40 year old forest, which is a young forest. But you have to really qualify the previous land use, how far, you know. You have to be thinking about the matrix, which is where that forests occur, rather than just the set aside, the area that's recovering. Because if you have a complicated matrix, you can really recuperate that stuff quite well. And even though you're in a fragmented landscape, you can be enriching that with a lot of different kinds of trees for, which are used for demarcation, for silvopastoral things, for orchards and so on. And it, that, that density is really hot. One of the things that's very interesting about Central America too is that about you know 90 percent of the, the agricultural systems have more than 10 percent tree cover, and it goes up. There's a very a very interesting bunch of studies. So when you go into fault, small farm systems, you really get a lot of trees. How that affects the larger recovery is a kind of story of contingencies and the quality of the matrix that these forests find themselves in rather than some kind of you know, simple linear thing. There's a lot of very good research to be done on this, by the way. More all the time. There's plenty of research to be done. Susan, uh, yes. some maybe take yeah. some right, right room comments. OK. Very interesting coverage of a hugely, very interesting coverage of a hugely complex and topical issue. And it's very enjoyable. And I was interested what you would, this might be a tough question, but what you would identify some of the key things which, say, people living in a country such as England could do in their daily consumer habits to help further reduce deforestation? Well, um, you know, there are, there are some, there are the, the usual consumer things, you know, which is keep drinking that, <laughs> keep drinking a lot of coffee. Uh, I don't. I know this is a tea drinking culture, but um, uh, more people grow coffee, and it really is a small farmer thing. So just keep drinking a lot of coffee. Make it a big point. Um, the other. Th um, so there's a kind of a, a, a consumer conservation dimension to that, which I. I mean, it's not the most important thing, but it's still an important thing to do. Um, the other thing is to sort of. Um, because those are linked into tree production itself. I myself am extremely nervous about these red projects um, because of the form that they're taking um, and the degree for, for people to invest in them. If you look at a, I urge you to look at a website like Forest Trend, which is basically a, a, a financial, a, a, financi a bundler of uh, monies for red projects in South America. And they have like more, almost $600 million, that is just for Brazil. But there aren't 600 million, you know, the, what they require is to reduce risk for investors. So red is not about forest recovery, it's about reducing risk for investors. And the way that you, so that they can, you know, sell those, further sell those things. It's, it, it, it's the world of finance. I haven't quite mastered it for this yet, but it's, it's one of these things where I think one should be very, very um, dubious about it. Because there, the other thing is that the, the international environmental organizations, for the most part, have correctly recognized these as, very, as, as places where they are particularly privileged because they so often run national parks for nation states. So in essence, it starts to be a mechanism of funding um, Conservation International or the Nature Conservancy or so on. So these become, uh, these, yeah, I, I used to be a big, bigger fan of red, but I have become less so over time. So in, the, in terms of what 
what you can do is to, um, the other thing is, um, well, the demands, I don't know, watch where your chicken feed comes from if you're growing chicken. Uh, because a lot of this is coming out of uh, out of the out of the American tropics, but really, in terms of what you can do, is in a certain sense um, be in favor of human rights in these places and um, you know democratic regimes in these places, rather than um, you know places like Paraguay that just had um, some coups and now it's like expanding its little oligarchs soybean production more than ever. So that's what I would say. I mean, it's not very satisfying, I realize that. <laughs> Drive less. <laughs> yeah. Hi there, thanks for a, a very interesting talk. Um, I'm quite startled by the kind of level of optimism, um, perhaps because it's hard to shake off the catastrophist narrative um, but also because I work on disaster risk in the in the um, Serra do Mar in Brazil, mm -hmm. um, which is very much linked to urbanisation and deforestation, continued deforestation of the Mata Atlantica. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just wondered if you could yeah, comment on the um, in Brazil that the the tendency now still towards developmentalism, Gilmer's. Um, uh, support for the Bancada Horalista or alliance, not necessarily support, but uh, leaning towards alliance with the Bancada Horalista, and evidence that deforestation actu actually has gone up again in the last year, or, or mm -hmm. certainly read something about that recently, the last year to 18 months. Um, also, I noticed that your graph on deforestation started in, on the reduction in deforestation, started in 2004, which, if I'm, I could be mistaken, but I thought it was the, that, that was the high point of deforestation, so if you went back a few years before no, that. I, I go back to um, when if the, the, the real dramatic drop is too sad. We, we can go and I, I think it was the one on the dramatic drop, but I just wondered if it might not look no, like the, such it, a it vast is decrease. Below the historic, since they've been keeping you know wall-to-wall -wall records, it's, this is the lowest, it's below that level. It's a very interesting question, and I don't have, I mean, first of all, um, I think that you know, just because we get a slowdown in deforestation doesn't mean we get an equitable society. I think probably you you probably saw this, which is that something like three percent of Brazilian landowners own fifty percent of the territory. So what we're not ne this dynamic does not necessarily produce equity, and the kinds of bricolage that's needed for income suggests that people are not like having the really greatest economic time you could possibly imagine. Um, you are seeing some um, uh, increase in the Cerro du Mar um, from essentially both from migration and again this contraction of small scale um, annual cropping systems. Um, in fact, I'm going to be going there in January, so I'm really so I, I would know better if I had, if I were further along my research field. Um, but uh, the the developmentalism is there's a bunch of big projects coming down the right, coming down the line, and this is the IRSA project. This is the international um, infrastructure development that's supposed to link them all of the Amazon together. And historically, we've seen that roads and a lot of road development will trigger these things. Although these roads already exist and have existed for a long time, it's paving, um, which anyone who's driven on, you know, you sort of think that paving isn't such a bad idea. I, think, you know, I know this is, I know this is, goes against the laws of God. Um, that, so one of the things that is that we're likely to see more, more of this kind of thing. The second thing is these big projects like the dam projects, and those are in the midst of a lot of resistance. And uh, but then, as a larger term development issue, Brazil does need it does need some energy. So the question is how you fulfill those energy questions without. But there's huge resistance to it, uh, and also to the to the one on the Rio Madeira. Um, so it's whether this is just a big deep breath before another reinscription of the, the socio-nature of Amazonia gets written. I don't know. I don't know. I can't read the future. But there's enough elements in here 
which makes me think that it's not going to be like that explosive deforestation that happened during, um, during the authoritarian period, where if you tried to resist it, you would just get killed. You know? uh, so so, and there, so there, it's a more, whether it, this kind of, whether we'll start to see upticks, there are reasons to believe that you would, but the dynamics of deforestation will be very, very different. Because it's not clearing for claiming in the way that it was. It's using it. We, we are unfortunately coming to the end of our time. So what I, what I would suggest is the following. First, um, those of you who would like to, um, Susanna's books are available for sale outside. If you buy them, you can get them signed by Susanna up here if you bring them back. The second is maybe those people who weren't able to ask their questions, if you'd like to come up them directly, you could do that, and um, maybe that we could uh, thank Susanna for her uh, wonderful presentation.